Yeah, so my medical career, I mean, I actually was a, I did my undergrad at U of M and did my medical school at Wayne State. Um, so I graduated back in 2005 from Wayne State and then did my residency in Chicago, uh, University of Illinois, Chicago. And then I, I, at that point, I knew I wanted to do cardiology and I came back to Detroit to do my fellowship here at Wayne State DMC. Um, and then towards the end of my fellowship, um, you know, uh, my, well, some of my current colleagues, along with my uh, old boss, or at the time, they recruited me to stay on as uh, one of the clinical faculty in the Division of Cardiology. Um, so that's, I, so right since fellowship, I've still been with Wayne State over roughly the past eight to nine years. Um, so my area within cardiology from the medical standpoint is I'm a non-invasive cardiologist. So I do clinical cardiology along with read imaging scans and do um, stress testing, EKGs, things like that. I don't do many invasive procedures uh, like heart catheterization and stuff. And then by being part of this program, I've been heavily involved in both the education of our uh, cardiology fellows, which we have a total of 12 each year, along with uh, peripherally involved in helping the internal medicine residency program in regards to teaching the residents when they're on our rotations, and then both directly being involved in uh, these courses through the medical school, but also um, teaching the medical students the year twos, but also the year threes and year fours that come rotate through the cardiology uh, rotation. So I had interactions with them. So, um, so yeah, it's kind of how my career is right now, kind of a collection of both, uh, you know, the, the obviously the clinical being the bulk of it, and the teaching, along with a small amount of research related, more helping some of my colleagues in regards to them, some clinical research endeavors. So the, uh, the Harvey, the Harvey simulator, the physical exam simulator, the mannequin that's, uh, um, and it's, it's a great tool that a lot of universities have or medical schools have and, uh, and Wayne State has one over at the uh, Cato Skills uh, Center. Mm -hmm. um, I have not used it this year, but in years past, um, pre-COVID, mm -hmm. I used to do through the uh, physical diagnosis, sorry, through the pathophysiology course, I would hold sessions with the medical students. We would do small session groups of eight to 10 students at a time. And that mannequin allows us to simulate cardiovascular sounds or cardiac sounds that you hear on examination that at the medical students level in the year two, you know, they haven't really gotten a chance as much to hear it on true patients, different murmurs and things that we describe in our course. So the mannequin allows us to actually teach them. We give them kind of a clinical scenario and then using the Harvey mannequin, we're basically able to reinforce those sounds using the mannequin. And in years past when I've done, unfortunately I haven't been able to do it the last two years because of COVID, but in the years past, it has been an exceptional learning tool for the students. They, you know, while we don't necessarily present anything new material wise when we do those sessions, the students love it because it actually reinforces. And cardiac sounds are something that in physical examination is something that's tough for year two students to fully grasp. Um, but yeah, I definitely want to, um, you know, do that again. And I've, and I've even gotten, you know, to help get different perspectives. I've had my 12 cardiology fellows also help me with those sessions, which they love doing in the past because, you know, they, it gives them a, a kind of one-on-one -on -one experience with the year two medical students that usually they don't have a chance to interact with any of the year one or two students at all, so. In prior years when I was part of the pathophysiology course, uh, that Barbara Bosch used to run. I used to serve as the um, a lecturer, but also then at times co-course director with her for the cardiovascular portion. Mm -hmm. And I had designed a, a PBL back then, uh, PBL cases that I designed uh, with myself and with the help of one of our, uh, um, you know, a year four medical students at the time who helped. And we used that as a, a tool to go over, uh, emphasize particular uh, key uh, diagnoses such as heart failure and coronary artery disease in a PBL uh, structure. But more recently in the Human Disease Foundations course, um, in our 
CBLs with them, uh, I converted our, um, you know, with the guidance of uh, Sentel uh, and uh, the Hubble of Sonal, I converted our, those PBL, the material in the PBLs to CBLs that I, we used to use those, uh, to use the illness scripts and disease maps that um, Sentel and the medical school have wanted to incorporate into our uh, lesson plans and, you know, was heavily involved in implementing it and uh, leading it with the students at that time. And I was even myself surprised at how well received the students. I was a little, I'll be honest, I was a little trepidatious at first. The student's reaction was definitely positive. And, um, and I can see, you know, now that if, if their mindset is thinking in that manner going forward, I think it's going to help enhance their knowledge. You know, I, I think our problem is I think we're thinking of it in the, the short term atmosphere of it, but I think it's going to enhance their knowledge more in the long term. So one of my colleagues that did uh, co-course directors for the course, for me, it's always oh, it like 15 years ago that I was doing this. And, you know, it was different even 15 years ago for them. I mean, you know, and their uh, more experienced colleagues, it was different even years before that. And so you're kind of, we're all kind of stuck in our ways of this is how it's traditionally been taught and why can't the students learn it this way? And so breaking out of that mold for us is, is was tough. Um, and, uh, but seeing the students reaction, but also, you know, hopefully seeing the, um, the positive impact that will have in their third and fourth years coming up along with their, you know, obviously tests and, you know, tests and, assemblies and stuff are important so seeing their improvement on those but I, I I want to see them do well on those but I also want to see the clinical side in the third and fourth year so I, I think there's always I think even with the smartest medical student who knows the answer to a question mm-hmm. you ask the question he knows the answer but the thing in the middle is what is missing and I think these illness scripts and disease maps with these CBLs we've been doing are helping to improve that portion of learning so but they're really going to see the benefit of this stuff, this foundational stuff, you know, 10 years or five years later when they're actually in the thick of clinically taking care of a patient and not have to worry about a test that they have to take coming up. I would say two, the two biggest things are number one, since the bulk of what I do 80 to 90% is clinical related patient based you know, taking care of those patients that are admitted to the hospital with either mild, moderate, or severe medical issues and being able to work collectively as a team with our trainees along with my subspecial, like the specialists in other disciplines and be able to turn that patient around, you know, be able to improve their status in the hospital, be able to either diagnose them with a disease that they didn't know they had, but it's treatable, the hospital and see us back in clinic that is the thing I love the most. I mean, that is definitely, and then the appreciation that our patients have for that when, you know, um, you know, we're doing what we should be doing and, you know, they, you know, I'm glad they're appreciative, but we, you know, should be helping them. So, um, and, but obviously, you know, they're, you know, definitely very appreciative. And then the second thing, because obviously we're clinician educators, mm-hmm. you know, you know, having, Rounding with students and uh, trainees, like residents and fellows, and you know, going over topics and particular patients, and them truly being engaged in what we're presenting. They're not just sitting there, kind of on their phone or this and that. They're actively listening to what we're talking about, but also they you can you can tell that you know um, that they actually care and are really thirsting for that knowledge. So when I can see that in their eyes and in their their replies to me when I ask questions that I really enjoy. Those two things are probably the, the two things I love the most. Um, can't say it happens all the time, but, you know, and unfortunately there, you know, on the clinic side, there's, you know, patients that unfortunately don't do well and pass away, even with the hardest working doctors and nurses and techs. Um, and then even from the learning side, you know, you try to strive and present material to the trainees and sometimes it just doesn't catch or they're not listening or, you know, but, um, but for the most part, people are pretty so that students are pretty receptive. So. so 
I first would tell them, you know, find first where you're in the education part of it, find where your um, passion most lies. Is it, is it doing a combination of teaching and research? Is it you want to just do mainly teaching or you want to be a heavier research-based uh, clinician educator? But I think, you know, um, focus, making it what your focus is. So, because the, cl- and unfortunately, academic medicine has come, you know, over the past 30, 20 years or so, it's come to a point where the clinical side is becoming more and more time consuming and rightfully so. I mean, taking care of patients, it's, you know, it's, it's very few and far between where a physician has 80% protected time to be able to do research and things like that. And those people that do have it, they have big research grants and things like that. Right. So if you're just like a clinician educator where you're not necessarily doing a higher powered research and you're doing a lot of teaching and love it, you may not necessarily be granted a certain amount of time to be able to do it. Um, so first you want to be able to find what you're passionate about. And if it's, for me, it's the teaching along with taking their patients. So mm-hmm. that once you find that, then you can find mentors that are similar that can help you. Like, I, I, I feel I have, you know, mentors, I think, you know, it's good to have one main mentor, but at the same point, having multiple mentors, I think you can gain advice of different aspects of your career from those people. So mm-hmm. I think it's like, find out exactly how you want to carve your career, what you want the different subset of your career to be, but then also then targeting mentors that can help that. And, you know, that's even something I always have to remind myself, you know, need advice from my colleagues that have been around for 30 years or 20 years. And, you know, right. um, and I've been only a, attending for almost 10 years. So, you know, I think, and, and always having that also thing, once you're stepping out of residency or fellowship and now you're a full-fledged physician and you want to give back in teaching, you know, you always need to know that you don't have all the answers. And so having people above you to be able to reach out to, because then that's going to also help you educate those under you. Otherwise, if they're just going to, you know, unfortunately, if they're just going to get, um, what you know, and that's it. You're on a, even though you're in attending and your badge says you're in attending, you know, there's, you know, and uh, even when my, when my father was alive, he like, he, he always, I think every day I would see him when I was over at their house or home, like I would see even for like 20 minutes, mm-hmm. he'd be reading something mm-hmm. or I don't really think he needed to, but at the same point he would, he would. He also constantly asking questions, the Socratic method, asking questions and trying to, you know, because you're only going to get better that way, whether you're a fresh medical student, whether you're a resident or whether you're an attending that's in their 70s still working like my dad was. So 